Amen. Well, good morning, Calvary. You know, it's amazing being able to walk around, greet folks, and then find out that you're going to preach and they stay to listen anyway. <laughs> a bunch of you had the chance to run out the door and you chose to stay. Those of you who do not know me, I am Chet Anderson. I am the executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. I've been here for 10 and a half years, and it has been my privilege and my pleasure to serve God as partnered with this family here in Lake Havasu City at Calvary Baptist Church. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a letter that Paul wrote to his friends and, the, and his friends that were in Philippi. And uh, for whatever reason, if you don't own a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles that are in the pews. I'm going to ask that everyone in here take one of those Bibles, open it up, and turn to page 1250. For those of you who are pulling one of those blue Bibles out and turning to 1250, you'll be ahead of most everybody else. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 4. And while you do that, I want to ask you a couple of questions. How many of you have ever gone to a physician for an illness or an ailment that you may have? J just checking. How many of you, when you went to that physician or that doctor, did that doctor give you a prescription or direction or a procedure that you needed to follow up on. That's why you went, right? Right. So here's the real tough question. How many of you went to that doctor, received that prescription, went to the pharmacist, got it filled, took it home, put it in the cabinet, shut the door, and never opened it and used it? Yeah, busted, right? Some of us. So why in the world did you go to the doctor in the first place, right? You wasted their time. You wasted your time. You made the pharmacy a lot of money because the prescription's sitting in your cabinet and not doing you a bit of good. And we can say, I can do it without that prescription, but if we took the time to go and they gave us a prescription, there's a pretty good chance it might help us, right? Or there may be a procedure that would help us get better, right? And some of you just turned me off because I insulted you because you still have prescriptions that you're focusing on <sighs> in the cabinet. You're going to go home and take your meds right after we get through, right? <laughs> this means yes. <laughs> I share a little story that happened to Chet. <laughs> I remember an occasion going to see my wellness doctor. And as I sat and began talking to my wellness doctor for a review, she pulled out her chart. She began asking me some questions about uh, my eating habits and my exercise routine. <laughs> wow! Y'all are the second ones that have done that to me. I'm starting to like that, that Saturday night service a lot better. Either they didn't get it, <laughs> or they were just trying to say or spare my feelings. So I told her on the average what I was eating and how little I had been exercising. And as we went through my diet, we came to a place where she began to inform me that most of what I was eating and most of my exercise habits were not conducive to help me as a diabetic to reduce my A1C. And I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what you're saying. And she said, well, what did you have for breakfast? And I told her, oh, you got to change this. You got to do that. What did you have for lunch? Oh, you got to change this. What do you normally eat for supper? Well, I'm pretty good about this, right? As I got through, she made the, or actually had the unadmitted gall to tell me that I needed to reduce the amount of fried pork chops and beans <laughs> that I was eating. To which I looked at her and got very irate. You know, I'm listening to the change. I'm listening to the exercise. But when you start messing with my pork chops and my beans, you have stepped over the line, lady. You understand me? And that's about how I said it. She just looked at me in this nice smile. You know, began sharing with me that she appreciated my ambivalence. I said, oh, no, I'm not ambivalent. I'm sure I'm not going to slow down eating pork chops and beans. 
I'm positive. I want to eat them. She said, well, it's your choice. You, you, you want your body to do better? You want to live long enough? As you've told me, you want to improve your health status, if you can do so, so that you can live long enough to see that grandchild that you're going to have walk across the stage when he graduates. And if you keep on the pace that you're at, he... Uh, he That is one handsome boy right there. <laughs> his name is Anderson Michael, named after his grandpa and his uncle. We call him Andy for short, and he is just fabulous. But that right there helped me think, you know what, Chet? You may want to make some changes in your life. You may want to take the advice that these folks are trying to tell you because they want you to improve your odds of seeing that young man walk across the stage with his doctorate degree and whatever it is that he is passionate about that God instills in him, right? Well, the Apostle Paul did almost identically the same thing for his friends. And I'm sure that there's some of those friends that were sitting there going, what, Paul, really? So let's read and see what they actually said. Starting in verse 4, chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. You see, Paul is offering us, if you will, a prescription, a, a recipe, a step-by-step -step opportunity for us to improve our lifestyle. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. Unlike my physician, when she first began saying, you got to stop this, stop this, stop this, stop this, stop this, change this, change this, change this, I got angry, right? And when we get angry, we have a tendency not to do what someone else tells us to do. Well, maybe you do. Chet has a tendency not to do what somebody tells us to do if I get a little ambivalent or angry with them, right? And this was a 10 o'clock in the morning appointment. At 3 o'clock, I was still ambivalent and angry. My wife comes home and she looks at me and she says, honey, what are you upset about? I said, can you believe? And I began explaining it all. And my loving wife of 24 years tomorrow looked at me and said, yes, praise God. <laughs> said, she made a mistake. And I'm like, you think? <laughs> and I'm thinking she's going to be on my side about the fried pork chops and the beans. She didn't say anything about those. She said, she overwhelmed you with the amount of change that she wanted at one time. And see, Paul recognizes that, and he gives us a step-by-step, -step, small changes that we can make in our lives to adjust as God changes us, makes it a little better. And the first one is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Psalm 100 says it this way, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all 
generations. Paul starts out by saying, you want to make a change in your life, you want to be different, rejoice. Make a choice to rejoice. Rejoicing, being joyful, is a choice we make every morning, every time at noon, all day long. We have that choice. And Paul is just so encouraging when he says to his dearest friends, remember he's talking to his family the same way that you're, you guys are my family. The same way I'm talking to you, rejoice, be excited, happy, make a choice to rejoice. Now, how do I do that, Chet? What does that look like in our life? Here is a couple of small steps, not overwhelming steps, hopefully small steps. First, he says, let your reasonableness be known, or in other words, be reasonable. Be reasonable. Some of you are looking in your, your, your Bibles, and it says, let your gentleness be known to all men. In every area of your life, show contentment. With that contentment, a generosity towards others. It's really difficult to rejoice when you are trying to be gentle and show generosity to others, isn't it? It makes it a lot easier if you choose to incorporate that into your process. Being reasonable allows you also to leverage the influence God has given you. He's given you to a point because he desires that you model for him to a lost and a dying world what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Does it mean that you're always, always negative? Does it mean that you're always looking for the worst? Does it mean that, oh, I don't want that person on my team because they never get along with anyone else? It means that you're making a choice to be gentle, to be reasonable. Now, I don't know about you guys. That's not something that's naturally easy for most of us. That's a learned behavior. And it's learned through our acceptance of a holy Savior named Jesus Christ. You see, God so loved each and every one of us that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. And then God tells us in your reasonableness, do nothing from selfish ambition. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But how do you do it? But in humility, parentheses, humble, gentle, reasonable, count others more significant than yourself. In other words, it's not always Chet's way and Chet's way only, and that's the only way. That person sitting next to you, think of them on occasion with gentleness and that they and their needs are more important than yours. Our team puts it this way, seek to understand before you're understood. You're putting value on the people that are around you. But sometimes, if I'm not getting things my way, now I'm pretty sure it doesn't apply to any of you, only me, I have a tendency to be unreasonable, and with that unreasonableness comes a bit of anxiety. Why? Because I want to get it done, and I want to get it done perfectly, and I want to get it done perfectly right now. Yeah, some of you are even finishing that, right? And you're nodding. That communicates as unreasonable to the world, just so we know. And I can't just choose to turn that off, but I can choose to allow God to help train me how to be gentle in those situations. So what's my first step then in being reasonable? Pray continually. Pray continually. That's what his word says here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your reasonableness be known do not be anxious about anything but everything. Say everything with me. Every, everything doesn't leave anything out, does it? It covers it all. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul's reminding us that the Lord is at hand. 
Now, this could refer to the nearness that we have of God, or it could refer to a coming, a returning of God. Either way you look at it, God is near. God is at hand. It is when you are afraid sometimes of your circumstances that you become anxious. It is for me. Fret and worry generally are signs of a lack of trust. Whether it's in the situation, whether it's in the person sitting next to me, whether it's in my employer, whether it's in my Savior. If I choose to be fretful, anxious, I am saying, God, you really don't have this, do you? I hope you did, but you really didn't because I need to do this myself. And you become fretful and anxious. And Paul's reminding us, God's saying to us, you're my child. I've got this. I'll protect you. I've got this. If you'll trust me, I'll guide you. I'll lead you. I've got this. But unfortunately, lots of times in our lives, we say, God, you've got that, but I've got this over here, right? God, you take care of the really tough stuff. I got all the little stuff. And then we get entangled with the little stuff, and we start chipping and falling. Then we start worrying, and we start fretting, and we start going, boy, I hope nobody else finds out. And our anxiety level gets larger and larger and larger, and then our unreasonableness starts to grow, and then we forget about staying in contact with God. I thought it was a beautiful expression that Julie shared this morning. Sometimes when we're having really lots of fun, we forget to stay connected. Develop a habit of praying continually. Believe it or not, there is this unwritten rule. I don't know where it is in here. Sometimes we adopted it. Maybe you were taught as a child that you had to close your eyes. I think we were taught as children to close our eyes so we wouldn't be playing around when the prayers were going on. But you can pray with your eyes open. (laughs) The most revolutionary thing in my prayer life was not only praying with my eyes open, but actually audibly saying it out loud while I'm driving or in the shower or while I'm walking around. God actually is present and he hears. And it's not just saying because I want to hear Chet talk. It's because I want to communicate with a holy God the passion that I have to stay connected to him. I want to give him my request. And then I want him to teach me how to shut my mouth and listen. Mm. Be still and know that I am God. You see, communication is verbally or action, communicating, and then receiving. It's not always the God, here is what I want, here's how I want it done, and God, by the way, here's the time frame that I need it done in. You got that, God? Good, go. It's not that way. Sometimes it's just a matter of us being still and saying, Lord, Which direction do you want me to go? Sometimes he uses your friends and your family. Sometimes he uses uh, your pastors. Sometimes he uses God's inspired word. But every one of those are applied to our heart through the Holy Spirit, I believe, to help us in this process of becoming more Christ-like. Because Christ was the most reasonable person that I have ever read any story about. And he constantly stayed in contact with the Father. Amen? But Chet, he don't have a clue where I'm at. You simply just don't know how bad things are in my life. And if you did, Chet, you would understand why I am the way that I am. Trust me. Been there. Occasionally still slide into that. Done that. Have the trophies to prove it. Operated in Chet's strength. Didn't know that there was a tunnel, much less an end to the tunnel. Didn't even know I was in a tunnel, right? Chet, you just don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't be so cheerful. You wouldn't be so excited. You wouldn't be trying to tell me to rejoice. Because Chet, you just don't know. And if you're here this morning... And you're in that pit of despair in your life right now. I have great, great news for you. 
God loves you. God is in that pit if you're his child with you, and God desires for you to prosper, to move, and to grow through that. How? By staying connected to him. When you don't know the way and you want direction, ask daddy. He'll give you the direction. Now, for me, sometimes it's a matter of focusing my thoughts. Focusing your thoughts. Paul talked about it here. Paul said, rejoice, pray continually, and then think on these things. Think whatever is true. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, think about these things. Focus your thoughts. Focusing your thoughts, you see, is a a peace that we get from God. That peace that surpasses any human understanding that we have. It helps us to guard our hearts from the nasty, filthy thoughts that we allow to corrupt the direction that Father wants for us. It helps us to change our mind. How? By allowing our minds to be the same mind as Christ Jesus. I don't know about you guys. The older I got, the further my arms needed to be away from me to be able to read clearly. That's why I have these. They bring things into focus. And I'm a hunter as well. And sometimes when I go hunting, I'm looking for a particular animal and I see it. It's on the ridge. And I throw my rifle up and I look down that scope. And that six by six bull elk just became a nice little pinion pine. Waving in the wind. (laughs) And I'm praising God that I had a good scope. Otherwise, I'd have had to figure out how to skin that pine tree. And I just (laughs) don't know how to do that. But God's saying the same thing to us. Paul is reminding his best friends. He's saying, guys, start out by rejoicing. If you've got a desire, if you've got a need, you need direction, ask Pray, listen, he said, but allow your mind to begin to pull into focus the same way instead of me trying to eat the bark off of that tree, right? He brought it into focus. God brings our minds and our thoughts into focus. And how does he say focus it? He says focus. And you notice he said, finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, sometimes when I get my thinking off, my wife reminds me that I've developed this habit of stinking thinking. Any of you ever guilty of stinking thinking? You, 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 your mind starts thinking on all of the horrible things instead of all the things that we talked about here. All the things that could go wrong instead of all the things that God's making go right in our lives. And we think stinkingly. If your thinking is stinking, here's a suggestion. Here's a suggestion. Start rejoicing. And if you can't rejoice, start thanking God for what he's done in your life. Start thanking God for who he is. Start thanking your mate for how wonderful they are. So here's a test. Here's an application for the next 30 seconds. I want you to look at the person to your right and the person to your left or the person behind you or whoever. And I want you for the next 30 seconds simply to tell them what you right now in this place at 10, 14, and 20 seconds are happy about. Go.
Okay, for those of you who are actually counting, that was 30 seconds. And here's what I'm going to ask you. Did it make any difference the last 30 seconds by sharing what you're thankful about in your attitude just for that 30 seconds? Did it make a little bit of difference in your life? Yeah, that's a starting process, and I think that's what Paul is trying to remind us of. He's saying start this process, be encouraged, remember the great things that our Heavenly Father has given and done for us, change your stinking thinking into a positive direction in a thought process. Allow God to focus our minds so that we can choose to be reasonable. Being reasonable is a choice. So that we can choose to pray continually. Praying continually is a choice. So that we can choose to allow God to focus our thoughts because focusing our thoughts is a choice that we make when we lean on Jesus Christ and allow him to change our lives. Remind yourselves of the excellent things God has created. In simple terms, ladies and gentlemen, practice. Practice what you've learned. Why do you go to practice? To perform excellently at the game. When you walk out of this door, you are walking in the mission field of life, and we are in here practicing. Perfect practice. Perfect practice prevents poor performance. Not just practice, because you can practice it wrong and go out and do it wrong. Paul's saying, here's a great way to do it right, ladies and gentlemen. Start out by rejoicing. Pray continually. Stay connected. Choose, make a choice to allow God to focus your thoughts. And then as Paul says in here, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. And you practice all of these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You are not ever, 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 ever alone. God is always with you. And do not underestimate the power of your influence by practicing what God has taught you. My desire in this place today is to minimize the stinking thinking in Chet's life and in your life and to make a choice to rejoice. Amen? Amen. Father God, we love you. and It's so exciting to be part of your team, God, because your team wins. Your team ultimately wins the prize, and the prize is that we get to spend eternity with you and Father, in the process, we get to love on a lot of folks on the way and encourage a lot of people around us. So my prayer right now, God, as we stand up and as we sing these next two songs, Father, some of us need to pray to you and just confess some things that are going on. Some of us need to rejoice and be excited. Some of us just need to be thankful for what you're doing in our lives. But God, there are some in this place that desire, need, and want to start a journey with you, make yourself real as we praise you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.